Today we're going to be discussing Stephanie Miller's book, The Butterfly Blueprint. We're going to be taking the last segment from this, and we're going to be looking at the butterfly stage. Once we are who God has transformed us to be, there is no going back. A butterfly cannot physically return to being a caterpillar, acting as it did before the transformation, and neither should we. In God's timing, the struggles we face strengthen us and prepare us for what we need to be authentic and share our story. A butterfly doesn't fly randomly. It flies to a flower and, lay, and lays eggs. It knows its purpose, and the goal at this stage is to lay as many eggs as possible before it dies. The butterfly has a short life span, typically two weeks or less. It doesn't waste any time fulfilling its purpose before it dies, and neither should we. The act of sharing your struggles with someone else is powerful. When you share struggles with others, there is a special kind of empathy for each other because we've been in each other's shoes before or are walking in them now. When we're honest about our cocoon experiences, it opens up a way to connect with others that lead uh, leads to transformation. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, James 5.16. The confession of our transgressions tears down the I'm perfect and never mess up facade. Instead, it gives oh, and gives up hope and support in the form of community and fellowship. The definition of accountability is simply being held accountable and responsible for our actions. You can't have an honest accountability without complete authenticity. Accountability is the showing of self to others and making a concerted effort to grow. There is something inherently special about being able to admit you need help in an area and asking someone else to come alongside you. If I desire to be held accountable for my actions, I need to be honest with myself and the person I have asked to hold me accountable. Healthy accountability givers help you find out your why and assess how committed and how willing you are to do what is needed, sometimes sacrifice, in order to meet your goal. The second goal of a healthy accountability giver is to understand and appreciate that growth is never linear. There will be slip-ups, there will be oopsies, but the important thing is helping the other person come up with their own conclusion about what lesson they've learned through the process. The goal is to strive for progress and not perfection. As we practice awareness, acceptance, accountability, we are more than halfway there. As an accountability giver, we need to celebrate all victories no matter how small. So what do we do when we mess up? Some people think that if you, have, that if you feel bad enough for what you did, you won't do it again. They suggest the shame is a strong motivator that if you feel enough of it, you will do what it takes to stop it. In perpetuating this belief, they attempt to create conviction in you. They want you to feel bad for what you did or didn't do. It isn't up to us to try to make someone else feel convinced or convicted. Understand, uh, understanding that allows us to be free, to fly and respond to others in love. It is acceptable to speak the truth in love, even if it is somewhat harsh, but know that your conversation should always be seasoned with salt, uh, according to Colossians uh, 4, 6, and grace. Uh, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, Ephesians 4, 15. In Colossians 4, 6, the rest of that verse says, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Our goal is to provide grace-filled accountability. How we react and respond in a safe environment produces grace-filled accountability. We want to be surrounded by people who foster our growth and authenticity. Grace-filled accountability assures us that it is okay to mess up because we are still loved. Sometimes the reaction, even if a negative one, is God planting a seed or even preparing the soil. Healthy accountability often means setting appropriate boundaries 
while continuing to support in a way that doesn't hinder their growth. To hinder growth and potential in another is to do for them what they can do for themselves. What we don't often realize is that there is growth in the preparation and the struggle, especially when it involves the butterfly emerging from the cocoon, as we'll see uh, as we continue to go through here. The struggle isn't necessary, uh, necessarily only what we do once we are in the cocoon. The very process and steps it takes to get out of the cocoon aren't just as, are just as important as our spiritual growth. There needs to be a delicate balance between doing too much for someone and being disinterested and disengaged from helping them. In a grace-filled accountability relationships, uh, a relationship, we attempt to spur one another on toward love and good deeds, Hebrews 10, 24. That account, or that doesn't mean we do the work for them. It also doesn't mean we should tell them what to do. Accountability works not as an all-or-nothing agreement, but as a relentless pursuit of becoming more like Christ. The truth is that we are all working towards something. We must understand that life will get in the way, but the most important thing is to get back on the wagon. Don't let someone fall away or drift away without checking on them. The devil is looking to put every excuse in your head not to do something. So the more encouragement you pr can provide for someone, especially biblically-based encouragement, the more it will drown out the voice of the enemy, telling them they don't matter and shouldn't even try. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And that is Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. There is a time and a place for biblical encouragement. Sometimes people just need to listen to where they are and what they are going through, especially during those hard cocoon times. As an accountability partner, you don't have you don't have to have all the answers. All you need to do is show love for that person. Love causes us to seek to encourage one another and often support. There are enough people in this world who will tear you down, so why not focus on lifting each other up? Being able to provide that kind of accountability that fosters growth and change with having realistic expectations. Some activities or things that are part of your daily life already have their own built-in accountability. Philippians 3, 13 to 14 says, Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Just like with everything else, there are some obstacles to overcome when you are helping someone stay accountable. If we are to, if we are not careful, these can cause us to stumble or cause others to prevent them from flying and reaching their ultimate potential. So there's a few blind spots that we'll mention here. Um, one is making assumptions. Uh, it is human nature to judge others and hold them to a certain standard or expectation but one way to avoid falling into this trap is to avoid assuming you know the reason behind the other person's behavior. Number two is making excuses. We tend to think of the person who is supposed to be completing the action as the one who makes excuses or reasons for not doing it. But the people, uh, but the person who is giving you accountability can also make excuses. The type of excuses can be related to the goal or the advice. While we offer forgiveness and understanding, we need to be careful not to make allowances for repeat behavior. Blind spot number three is making comparisons. Far too often we compare ourselves and our progress to others. We can't compare our progress with others because everyone's journey looks different. It's detrimental to compare ourselves with others and tell them about it. The bottom line is we want to encourage and motivate the person, but we don't. We can't do the work for them since the lasting motivation is co to complete their goal must come from the Holy Spirit inside them. We can fan the flame, but they must have the spark inside themselves to begin with. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with the perseverance the race marked out for us. 
Before we can set out to meet our goal, we need to fully understand why. We need to ask ourselves some deeper questions and to help investigate further regarding our reason for the goal and what makes it worthy of sacrificing and why it is so important. There is always a future action dependent on the ability to reach your goal. Examining your motivation behind your why helps you fully visualize the outcome. Fully engaging your senses in this visualization can make the dream feel more tangible. When you invest time into imagining that life, uh, what life would look like with the desired outcome, you have started what is known as self-actualization. And breaking down each line in Hebrews 12.1 will help explain this more. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, this cloud of witnesses refers to your people. It is your community, your tribe, who is there to cheer you on as well as catch you when you fall? Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So we know that it isn't up to us to fix ourselves, and we must allow God to have his way in this area that we're struggling with. Having the freedom to be authentic and transparent, we can list our triggers and decide to avoid them. Living from the place of freedom to be who God called us to be. We throw up everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles because true spiritual growth is an endless pursuit to understand the heart of the Father and the desire to be better causes us to do better. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And this is referring to the determination and grit. That means that despite what the obstacles we face, we never stop running. When we slip up, we don't stay there, but we do what we need to do to get back on track. Every action moves you closer to God or the, or away from him. Our paths are already made. It is up to us to keep moving forward in the right direction. Every choice I make is either leading me down the path God has, ha, um, has for me or leading me away from what God has for me. A goal or a plan is important because otherwise we can easily make choices based on our feelings or incorrect thoughts, fueled by false beliefs. We know that we are each crafted with a unique purpose for the glory of God, even though we may not know exactly what that is. We do know when we aren't making the best choices related to our spiritual growth. That is when we are when our outward actions need to reflect our internal hearts. Living like the transformed creatures we are is so important. What we think about is reflected in what we do, and that includes actions and words. Examining our hearts and true motives for seeking a goal will show us where our true treasures lie. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. The success of an accountability relationship can be measured in the area that we set our initial goal and how much it affects others around us. The caution here is to be careful of who we let in to our inner circle and who we allow to influence us. So look at the people that you're hanging around with, the kind of people you want to be hanging around with. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another, Proverbs 27, 17. And 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. The company we keep or the people we are around influences us for the better or the worse. It is a slow fade into these social sins, recognizing the type of friends we hang around who influence us to represent uh, represents just one of many choices we have to make to guard our hearts and protect our spiritual growth. The proverbial iron can only sharpen another piece of iron and cannot sharpen wool. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 to 15 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, 
Warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone. We know the Holy Spirit is not only in us, but working inside us based on the fruit we produce. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Sometimes it is harder to keep trudging along a path, a difficult path, if you don't see progress. When you mention growth, you see and celebrate those victories. It makes it a little easier to keep going, while moment by moment decisions can be what reflect reflect the heart of God, how you respond to the world around you, especially circumstances in your life you can't control, speaks to your godly character. Taking what we've learned about the key attributes behind the butterfly mindset, we look at the importance of authenticity and action to be able to share our story and gospel with others, to help each other stay on track, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and we help each other stay focused and remain in our lanes. The last key of the growth process is action, and it really doesn't come after accountability. It comes along with it. We are asking for accountability for action, for our actions, observable behaviors that measure our spiritual growth. So with accountability, we can take action, but even with someone encouraging us and cheering us on, it can be hard to take that first step. Authenticity doesn't always precede accountability or action, but when it does, there is a key difference in not only the type of goals we set, but also how we meet those goals. Spiritually speaking, every action is either helping you become like Christ or pushing you away from him, keeping in mind that every choice and action has a spiritual consequence can also help you make that first step. Evaluate the pros and cons from an emotional, logical, and spiritual perspective. Take comfort knowing God has equipped you with everything you need to be successful for what he has given you. Just as God made everything beautiful in its time, so he will also reveal himself in time. And Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Overcome obstacles. Inevitably, when you decide to take a step in faith, opposition will arise. Opposition can be in the form of thoughts that go through your head or situations or circumstances that pop up and make it harder for you to do what you set out to do. By tackling the reasons we remain stuck in a particular habit, we can be confident to take a step forward even if we are unsure where we're headed. That helps us evaluate whether we are living from a caterpillar or butterfly perspective. We must have faith that God not only will be there to catch us when we fall, but that he has a plan for our lives. We need to trust him. As the butterfly emerges from the cocoon, it must be willing to use the wings God has given it to fly. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. Scripture tells us that God not only knows our actions before we execute them, but also our words and thoughts. That is both humbling and comforting. Psalm 139.4 says, Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, know it completely. Uh, and Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I, com before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I pointed you as a prophet for the nations. We choose our thoughts. We filter through the thoughts that are not from God and from those God-giving thoughts we speak truth, love, and hope to others. The Bible tells us that we have control over our thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Every obstacle we face is an opportunity to learn and grow and show others what we've learned. We don't grow unless we step up and step out. In the hard times and even when we feel isolated in our cocoon, 
which is training and preparing us for what lies ahead, God is with us, and we will never face our battles alone. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. We need to learn to value our emotions. And you should never act from an entirely emotional standpoint. Instead, appreciate these emotions when they come up as they might be trying to tell you something. Strong emotions are indicators that something is out of balance or out of whack. Never be afraid of strong emotions that you experience and always do your best not to judge yourself for the emotions you're feeling. God created everything, including our up and down emotions, which means that they have the meaning and serve a purpose for our, in our lives. Valuing your emotions as indicators of something deeper going on within you means you do not judge them or judge yourself for having them. This idea of not judging our emotions, but letting them go comes from the practice of mindfulness, which is a great tool to use to stop looking at the next thing and instead become intentional and appreciate where you are on your journey. Growth doesn't happen when you reach your destination. It happens on the way to your destination. So value your emotions um, and take them as showing you something that's deeper and letting them dictate your behavior. We also need to expect moments where we're going to be refined. So when you react or respond to a situation favorably or unfavorably, you need to know that those times don't define you, but that they can refine you. We examine our actions under the microscope to determine whether our choices are moving us forward or toward or away from our relationship with God. The good news is that God is a God of second, third, and even fourth chances. If you respond poorly the first time, he will give you another opportunity to apply what you learned as a result of your reaction. You may or may not have heard the caution to never pray for patience because God will give you many opportunities to practice patience in your everyday life. We are refined, sharpened, and tested. But the good news is that when we endure things, we come out stronger than before. That is why we enter the cocoon as caterpillars, but leave as butterflies. This third, I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. Zechariah 13, 9. If you can manage to look at your circumstances in terms of what you can learn instead of what you don't know or can't see, you will be able to see God in every circumstance. Well, I have just been uh, blessed with so many people who are requesting to be on the show, and I'm impressed with how many people want to share their testimonies or what they're doing uh, for the Lord right now. Uh, if I haven't got back to you, I promise I will get back to you. Uh, I look forward to, to speaking with each of you and interviewing you. And uh, keep tuning into the show. There, there's lots of, of new people that are coming on here. And if you're considering uh, wanting to, to come on the show, uh, just shoot me an email at tpeters745 at gmail.com. And uh, I will get back to you.